Hello, art parents. Welcome to December. I can't believe we're here already. Um, I'm really excited about this month's artist. It's Johann Johannes Vermeer. Um, he's one of my favorite artists, and he's an excellent example of the Dutch Renaissance or the Dutch Golden Age. Um, so to start out, I think it's best to just kind of give a brief history about the Dutch Golden Age. If there's a map in the classroom, it's great to show the kids, just say, you know, here are the modern day Netherlands, point out, um, you know, point out Denmark's included in that. And then um, I just gave a brief warm up by comparing him to Botticelli. So Botticelli um, lived in Italy. Here's the main part of Europe where there was the Renaissance about a hundred years earlier. And then this is the North's kind of answer to the Renaissance, is the Dutch Renaissance or the Dutch Golden Age. Um, and then we talked about the factors that went into it. So the Netherlands were in a unique position. It's a great port shipping area. They had a lot of new economic wealth. They were kind of a center for trade. Interestingly, also, um, they were Protestant. They've been Protestant for quite a while. And so we talked briefly about Catholicism and how like France and Spain and Italy were all strongly Catholic countries. Think of the cathedrals that you see, those beautiful castle-like cathedrals, everything's very fancy. And, um, and then compare that to Protestant churches are rather plain. Um, there tends to not be as much pomp and as much art and the church just doesn't, that's not where they spent the money. Um, which, you know, is very interesting in and of itself, but not really for grade school. Um, okay, so we talked about how the art is much more simple. It kind of gives them kind of a, an intro into this. And it's nice, it's always nice to compare back to past artists we've done. It kind of gives it a nice continuity. It builds on what they know, right? So I said, today we're talking about Johannes Vermeer. This is a picture that is believed to be a self-portrait from one of, his, um, one of his paintings. And the kids really got a kick out of the clothing, of course. So we had to talk for a minute about how clothing has changed. Um, we talked about the Dutch. Dutch Golden Age art is very realistic. And interestingly, because of this economic wealth and growth that they had, the middle class had gotten much more wealthy. And because they were more wealthy, they were able to commission paintings to decorate their homes and to decorate the militia's group headquarters or, um, or a social group headquarters or the, you know, the, the city buildings. So there was a lot of art happening at this time. It was a great time to be an artist. And art was, um, it kind of branched into genres or specializations. There was historical painting, which was considered the highest art form, but also the least, um, the least popular, the least, the least in demand. Um, this would include like popular subjects, Greek and Roman mythology, religious art, and uh, then there's portrait painting, individual or groups, and there are a lot of really great examples of group painting from this period, but not from Vermeer, so we won't really talk about that. Um, and then we have genre painting. That is what Vermeer did. He painted scenes of everyday life, and it's beautiful. It's fun to look back at that and see kind of how life was different. And then there were landscapes, which we remember are a picture of a place and still lifes, which are pictures of things, pictures of an inanimate object. Um, so let's talk about Vermeer. He was born in, or born in October of 1632 in Delft, Denmark, and he stayed in Delft his whole life. He never, he never went on to a bigger city, um, which was very common for painters back then. He was called, in the 1900s, his art became popular again, and he was called the, the Sphinx of Delft, because we really don't know much about his life. We know that his father was an art dealer, an inn owner, and art dealers were really common. This was kind of a new profession, and it was becoming more common. Um, so that was something that he inherited and something that he took on, as well as painting. Um, he married Catherine Bolenis. 
and convert it to Catholicism, which is kind of a big deal in a Protestant country. And you'll see the influence in his art. We don't have a really, he had some great paintings that show that Catholic symbolism or that Catholic symbolism, but we really don't have those included in our lesson. So we're just gonna gloss over that. Um, so he had 15 kids. Can you imagine 15 kids? Um, and then for older kids, you might even want to mention 11 of them survived into adulthood, which was common back then. Life was a lot harder. People died a lot younger. Um, none of them were artists. And Vermeer never had a student, which is kind of an interesting thing. Also interesting, we can't trace back who his master was. So we really don't know if Vermeer was self-taught or if he studied him under a master but just has a very different style. And so the art history experts aren't able to trace it. Um, so again, that's kind of why he was the Sphinx of Delft. We really don't know too much about him. He died in December of 1675. He did not live very long. They believe he had a stroke, which is when a blood vessel bursts in your brain. Um, however, his wife said he had fallen into a frenzy. In a day and a half, he went from being healthy to being dead which that's kind of consistent with a stroke. Um, but it was kind of a rough life. We, we've talked about this before, but a lot of artists really struggle to find, um, to find wealth or to be, um, to be recognized in the art world. Vermeer was recognized in the art world. He was recognized by the critics as being an excellent artist, but he still struggled financially. And partially that's because there were a lot of artists and here you could talk about supply and demand a little bit. Um, also, because the Netherlands are kind of a small area and they're a new trade leader, they were being invaded a lot. The Spanish invaded, the Portuguese invaded, and that wreaks havoc on the economy. So things were always kind of tight for Vermeer and his 15 kids or 11 kids. Um, Okay, so also interesting, and we can see this in Vermeer's paintings, is he was known for his shadows and his use of light. Um, he's got very dynamic shading. You can see that there's a definite light source, and there are these beautiful highlights and beautiful, beautiful slight gradations in his shading. Um, honestly, the prints that we have in our library are not super great prints. They don't show his paintings in their full um, full color, which is kind of unfortunate, but you still definitely get the idea. Look at the careful way the lips have the highlights. Um, look at the folds and the robes. It's beautiful. Vermeer was really interested in the camera obscura, which was a new invention at the time. And I think his interest in, for, in photography really shows through in his paintings. Kind of that super, super realistic, just beautifully detailed, rich painting. The other thing that Vermeer was well known for was his use of rich colors, rich pigments. Um, now back in the day, artists could not go to the art store and buy a tube of paint like we can now. And the majority of artists now just buy a tube of paint. Back then, they had to take a medium, an oil such as linseed oil um, or a few other oils that were used and mix it with a pigment like this. And they'd have, to, they'd have to blend it and get just the right amount. Sometimes they would go out and they would dig up clay or dirt and sift through it for the elements that they wanted and dry those out and mash them into a powder and then use that to mix and make their paint. It was a much more intense process. It was also, <coughs> excuse me, a much more costly process. Um, paints do still vary today based on what's in them. For example, this tube of paint is, it's a synthetic, so it's relatively cheap. This was about $10, $10-11 for this tube of paint. But a tube of paint, like a real lapis tube of paint today, would still be two, dollars $300. It can be very expensive based on what's in there. Vermeer loved two colors especially. Um, that were very expensive. Lapis blue, lapis lazuli, um, which is ground from a semi-precious stone. It's, it's difficult to come by. Um, and then Indian yellow, which was produced in India. And you want to hear something kind of crazy. The, the way Indian yellow is made is by feeding cows only mango leaves and water. 
and then collecting their pee when they pee. And you dry that and and it makes the powder that makes Indian yellow. It's kind of gross, huh? Um, I read online that it actually was pretty stinky too, pretty stinky to use. So the kids kind of get a kick out of those little facts, no matter what age they are, right? <laughs> but look at the colors that it makes. Look at this Indian yellow. This is a um, portrait of a woman, a woman writing, I think, a lady writing. You can see her beautiful yellow jacket and the thing that you can't get from prints that you can see when you see a painting like this in person is there's a depth, there are layers, and the light shines through the oil, and it just, it's amazing. It's so beautiful to see. Um, look at his careful shading. You see the folds of the robes, just like it were in the picture, the ribbons and her bonnet, and the detail is just amazing. And I think that's definitely worth pointing out to the kids, the detailing on the furniture and the box. And it's a beautiful painting. It is just as realistic as a picture, um, but maybe even better. I don't know. <laughs> Let's take a look at another one. This is woman holding a balance. This is actually his wife, Katharina, Katharina that was the um, model for this one. So that's kind of interesting. He used his wife and kids often in his work. Um, but again, take a look at the way the light kind of looks like it's shining through her hood just a little bit. You can see the highlights and see how it's just slightly transparent. That is, that is a difficult thing to, to achieve in painting. It's beautiful. Um, you can also take a minute to look through. You might want to look. We looked back through of these other two as well. Let the kids kind of tell you what they see, what they feel. One thing that I think is super interesting about Vermeer is that his paintings look like it's a snapshot. He looks like, it looks like he opened the door and snapped a picture of this woman measuring something or snapped a picture of this lady writing and she looks up at him. You can see there's such an intelligent look in his, in his subject's eyes. And I think that's amazing because these paintings were painted over several hours, 20, I mean more, maybe even more, 20 hours of work. So the model had to sit there and wait for it to be done. It's hard to capture that look of like surprise, like that genuine moment, which I think is so beautiful. Um, I saved this one for last. This is my favorite. You can see that lapis lazuli blue in there. Um, this is woman with a pearl earring. Look at the look on her face. What do you think she's thinking? Isn't it beautiful? This painting is so captivating to me and to many other people. As a matter of fact, there have been several short stories, a few books, and even a movie written because someone saw this painting and they were inspired by it. And isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing that something painted hundreds of years ago can still spark our creativity today. It's wonderful. Okay, so let's take a look at what we're going to do. Today we are working with paints on tag board, which is awesome. Um, I have, oh, let me grab a pencil. I'm not going to stop because I can't edit my movies. Um, but we're just going to keep moving. Um, so we have a piece of tag board. The kind of fun thing about this is it's stiff. It takes paint well. It has a little bit more texture to it. Some of them have more texture than others. And then it has color, and the color kind of shows through your paints a little bit, which makes it interesting. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to work really quickly to rough in my subject. And we'll just keep, well, I'll just keep working off this same board. Um, since it's kind of, I was only able to get so much. It's, you know, it's expensive. We were able to get a lot of it donated. Um, but we'll just keep adding to this board. I think it'll be just fine. So I'm just going to show the kids, um, like I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to paint this woman. I'm just going to quickly, I'm just going to sketch in, you know, here I want her hair. Here's where I want her face, her neck, and her shoulders. I'm not going to put in her features. This isn't the time to draw her face. We're just putting in the, the very basic details. This is what artists call roughing in. And then we are going to take our paintbrush um, and a few things to keep in mind that help the kids when we're painting. Um, a few things for you. One, really you just want a dot of paint on each of the kids' plates. Just a teeny bit is really all it takes. If they need more, they'll ask for more and you give them more. I mean, don't make them feel like they can't use it. But 
a lot of times they don't end up using the colors as much as they think they will. So you don't want to give them a big squirt of paint um, because it just wastes a ton. And I actually tell the kids, because they kind of like knowing, I'm like, these are kind of expensive paints. It's kind of special that we get to use them. I'm only going to give you a little bit, but if you need more, just ask. The other thing I did was I don't, um, I didn't give them every color in the bin. I just gave them the basics. So make sure you've got like red, yellow, blue, green, um, some white. We got a lot of Christmas scenes in my class today. Um, and then if they want more, then you can always add more. It's, it's easy to add more. So I tell them the tricks you need to know when using a real artist brush and real artist paint. Um, we, first of all, need to be nice to our brushes. We need to be nice to them. They're beautiful, nice, fine art brushes. So we dip them in the water. We don't flick the water around. We just tap it off on the edge. And then I'm going to dip it into the paint. But look how much paint I put on my brush. Do you see? If I put paint clear down to here, I can't get that on the paper. That's not how brushes work. Brushes are meant to be used gently in light strokes. So all I need to do is put it on the very tip. If we get it down into the silver part, this is called the barrel, it can make the brush lose its shape and it's not as good to use in the future. And then I'm just going to go ahead and paint on my board. And if you want to use the white side, you are welcome to use the white side. Um, I don't want to limit the kids in what they can do, but it's kind of fun to use these, the darker sides, and get um, get some kind of interesting shading and depth into our color. So that is, you can see, I mean today I just did a little bit of yellow in the background. Here I've just done a little piece of the shoulder, just a little part to give them an idea. Um, and then I just show them. When I'm done, I'm just going to gently scribble on the bottom of the cup. I'm not going to push hard. I'm just going to gently scribble and wipe it off, and I'm ready to go on to the next color. I gave one cup for every two kids. They can share between desks and really only fill these halfway because spills will happen. Um, and then at the end, you'll want to just quickly rinse out the brushes. Just go back to the back sink after you've collected all the brushes and um, just run them under the water. Take your finger and just kind of splay out, um, splay out the bristles there and kind of rub them around. And then if you don't mind, just push them back into a point and then you can just leave them on the art cart to dry. I set out a paper towel, just lay them flat to dry there. Um, then it'll keep our brushes in nice shape. These are a little expensive, so we want to take good care of them. Uh, one thing to notice, if um, they are new, so new, it's going to be white, there will be some color that stays in. Don't stress about that. It just, it's what happens with white bristle brushes. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm super excited for you to have this fun, um, fun lesson this month. It's so fun for the kids to get to paint on something a little bit different and to paint with acrylics. A lot of kids haven't done that, so they'll enjoy it. Um, we had a great time in Mrs. Brown's class today. I hope you do too. And please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or any suggestions. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.